How's everybody doing? You guys, <laughs> how's KubeCon going? I didn't expect that we're going to have uh, such a big audience today. Thanks for coming. Um, uh, so this is a tutorial, a one-on-one -on -one session. Uh, set up your laptop for Kubernetes and get productive. And just straight off the back, I just want to ask, like, do you guys uh, like to be productive? Do you like to be, you know, uh, driving, efficient. driving, efficient. yeah, drive efficiency, and and be cool, and you know, stand out from your colleagues out there. Yes, sounds good. Yeah, because we've actually been surprised. We've seen a lot of people, even at this conference, you know, they have a nice uh, laptop set up with kubectl and you know the way they're doing is basically running uh, commands uh, in a poor shell uh, you know not proactive just trying to type and you know i've been at the show, show, showrooms booths it, those demos boring you know people typing slowly uh, so same here like you know like if you like to drive a you know old car that's that's fine with you uh, but there's always better choice, right? You can get uh, something like Tesla and, you know, get an autopilot, nice screen, uh, like an iPad in front of you, and, you know, everybody around you will be like, wow, this, this is cool. And so you guys uh, here at KubeCon, um, probably also, you know, getting a lot of stickers uh, at, at the booth. If you didn't get it, I think, uh, you know, there's still a lot of them out there. But you know, there's something inside that you have to fix uh, on your laptop side. So uh, our tutorial is pretty much starting for you here. You are a young sky worker uh, trying to you know figure out the nice kubectl commands and uh, you know try to switch namespaces, contexts, uh, and see what happens, right? Uh, but we're hoping like by the end of the session, you're going to become. Uh, you know, experienced Jedi, and will be able to uh, surprise your colleagues at, at, at work and get productive. Sounds like a plan? Yeah. All right. So my name is Archie. I'm CNCF ambassador from Canada. I'm organizing uh, meet meetups uh, across Canada, seven cities right now. And uh, today with me, uh, one of my co-organizers from Quebec. Exactly. Hello, everybody. Um, Sebastian, software engineer, um, involved in the community, making some PRs and harassing some maintainers. Um, and, and I guess we have a lot to offer today uh, for you. Yeah, so actually, uh, Sebastian is uh, give this talk at our meetups, and it was very popular. A lot of people liked it. Uh, and he also maintaining one of the projects uh, that is uh, around efficiency which is, I think, KubeColor. I, I actually bring back KubeColor to something working uh, efficiently. If you don't know that, you, you will learn the, during the conference. So, yeah. so just sit and wait. Uh, but yeah, but I, I had this talk. It was a like 15, 20 minute talk just presenting the tool and, and how to install it and the URL. So this is totally different because we're going to do a hands-on. We're going to demo everything that we're saying. Um, and we we'll, We'll try to give you everything so you can replicate either here if the Wi-Fi and the network allows it, yeah. or later at home, maybe not at the hotel. Yeah, but at home, yeah. And we apologize. We're from Quebec, so our accent is a little bit weird, but uh, we we Quebecois. Thanks. Uh, so, what what we need for this tutorial? And uh, unfortunately, uh, we just heard that you know the previous. Uh, um, tutorial in this room had had some issues with Wi-Fi, so we're hoping for the best, but uh, it might be a, a complex problem for us as well. So um, what we're looking here is um, we want to have your laptop uh, with uh, pretty much shell iTerm set up, and we're going to be you know playing with Kubernetes cluster, and we're not going to go inside of the Kubernetes control plane. We're not going to talk about API servers, schedulers, con controllers, and whatnot, and kubelets. Uh, our talk is really going to be focusing on, on, on the laptop itself, uh, talking to Kubernetes API server for the, uh, you know. Uh, Arshi, API. isn't that the time to ask the audience who knows about Kubernetes, the API server, the scheduler, and, and Kubernetes internals? Who, who, who knows that? 
Who feels like very confident? Maybe not expert, but very, very confident. Oh, a few hands, not that much. So, yeah, so like who is like never run kubectl command in the life? Do we have? Never. We okay, have so that's person. okay. Who, <laughs> you will learn good. a lot then. <laughs> All right, so that's good, yeah. Uh, so yeah, so for the requirements for this uh, tutorial, um, we tried to uh, you know, cover as much platforms as possible, but mainly we were doing uh, our preparation on the Macs, and so this part has been tested well. For the rest of the part, we'd, we give our best. Uh, our um, tutorial is open source, so if you, if you see any issues, we are happy for the PRs. Yeah, well, whatever we present here is usually focused on Mac OS, on ZSH, but it's working on Linux. It's working almost the same on Windows, even if we don't like, explain everything for all the laptops and all the OSs and all the, uh, you will be able to replicate just by searching in the docs, usually. So quick show of hands, uh, who is running Mac OS here? All right, that's good. Majority. Uh, Linux. Okay, and then Windows. All right, so. And then Windows on a corporate laptop where you can do anything. <laughs> Nobody, no, that's not possible. Man. All right. I, I think, uh, you know, it's still, there will be an experience that, you know, you might not be able maybe to run some of the commands, but you, you can go check in the documentation maybe, uh, but there's, obviously there's some, you know, if, if you, you cannot use ZSH, there will be potentially some of the features that you'll not be able to use. Uh, but yeah, like I, we're hoping you're still gonna learn a lot. So what we uh, basically need, the, the key requirements is, and we put it in our tutorial, uh, we, don't, we cannot provide you any Kubernetes clusters today. We're hoping you have one on your laptop or you have one on your cloud provider and whatnot. So pick any Kubernetes cluster that you want and you, know, you can install all of the tools that we're gonna be talking. Uh, on your laptop, and they will be communicating with this Kubernetes cluster. So, just want to ask, like, who who has any Kubernetes r running on on your laptops? Okay, so good. And uh, who has like cluster in the cloud that they can connect and potentially play around? Sounds good. I don't know for the rest of the folks. Uh, I just think like we have all the steps to install K Kubernetes cluster on laptop. It's just this potentially might be uh, problematic with the Wi-Fi, so I don't know. I, 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 would, I would, I would, I don't know what to say, but we'll don't, see. Yeah, don't blame us. Yeah, don't blame us. <laughs> blame Cisco. <laughs> All right. So uh, if you want to follow tutorial on your laptop, uh, and you know, if if you want to reproduce steps with your colleagues, friends, uh, so we have. Uh, website where all the steps are, and you can pretty much you know do it at, at your personal time if you didn't finish some of the um, configurations. So we'll so, give a few minutes to scan the barcode, or I think uh, this is a short short link that also brings you to the website. So we'll give you a few minutes just yeah. to make sure everybody's connected. So you, you can follow along uh, if if you go on the website and start to do everything from the website, you're not going to follow us because there's some few things we're not doing, some things we're doing a little bit differently during the demo, some things that you shouldn't do because it's just for demonstration purpose. Um, so keep following us, but still, we're going to go on this website and copy and paste all the comments in our uh, demonstration. All right. <clears throat> Everybody's okay with the QR code well, or the just, URL? Let's wait a little bit more. Who, ha who has a problem to access the website? Okay. Cool. Doesn't work the QR or? Okay, good, all right. Okay, sounds good. So we can carry on and we're gonna start the first chapter. Um, so you are young future Jedis uh, and you wanna come to KubeCon, maybe learn some Kubernetes, um, understand how things are working. Uh, so this is a one-on-one -on -one tutorial, so we decided, you, you, you know, there's probably a lot of people who are just starting with Kubernetes, so we're probably gonna touch up some really basics. 
uh, but we're going to try to move forward fast and then once we explain the namespaces, contexts, we can move forward and uh, show more advanced stuff. Does that sound good with everyone? All right. Okay, so first we're going to talk about new SSH, uh, which is our cube cutter. So uh, for the sysadmins out there who probably you know, never connected to Kubernetes cluster, I, I, I think this is a very good analogy. You know, back in the days we had servers, we want to connect to them, and we used our SSH, uh, you know, provided our credentials, uh, provided the address of our server, and then we'll be able to connect and you know, manage our application. Uh, and then, you know, obviously technologies like Ansible came where you can specify many directions and provision many servers. So I think there's a, some analogy here uh, with Kubernetes. Uh, so uh, kubectl is a CLI that works with Kubernetes, communicates with Kubernetes. Uh, Kelsey Hightower says it's a new SSH, and I agree with him. So the idea here is that uh, you have a kubectl installed on your laptop or maybe in the cloud shell, uh, and through the HTTP, you will be able to talk to Kubernetes cluster, provide resources, deploy things, delete things, uh, and all the communication is going through Kubernetes API. But the first step that you probably need to do is to install kubectl itself. So uh, this is pretty much uh, not a problem. So uh, we have the steps uh, in the lab. So I think we have the uh, already installed, right? So yeah. We so obviously it's already installed on the laptop. So we're, I think we're not going to demo that. Yeah. Uh, but maybe that's the time to introduce, like, very quickly the the, the, the companion website. Oh yeah. Okay. Uh, maybe a little bit bigger. Yeah, bigger. Um, yeah. Let's let's just uh, let's let's get into the kubectl itself just to show a couple of commands. So to do that. Mm -hmm. So that's just the beginning. So we're, we're just creating some folder, and we're because we're going to generate some YAML in that. Of course, it's Kubernetes, uh, and we want to keep everything at the same place. Yeah. So for the people who doesn't have kubectl installed uh, on the laptops, please go ahead and run the command that you uh, should run for your platform, uh, whether it's uh, Apple, Mac OS, Linux, uh, Windows. So the commands are here. Uh, if you have uh, like Using Google Cloud, if you have G Cloud, you can also install um, kubectl through the G Cloud components install. Uh, so just to check that, you know, we have uh, our kubectl here. Uh, so kubectl version shows uh, what are, what is the version of the client uh, kubectl supports. So here we have um, version for 1.25.3. <laughs> Pretty much, we're running on the bleeding edge. So, as you know, Kubernetes 1.25 is the latest release uh, today, and uh, our community of Kubernetes maintainers are working to have a support for Kubernetes 1.26 in, I think, a couple of weeks. And uh, as you know, uh, Kubernetes has right now release cycle uh, three, three releases per year. So it used to be four, now it's three. So that is kind of you know change. So right now you see that uh, the connection to the server local host was refused. Uh, this is because we don't have any Kubernetes clusters installed on this laptop, and that's normal. Yeah, uh, and another thing probably that worth to mention, you know, sometimes people install kubectl on their laptop and. After a couple of years, they decide, okay, let me like refresh my knowledge. Uh, obviously, the Kubernetes is keep up, keep moving forward, right? And uh, if you want to be successful and have a good experience, try to make sure that your kubectl um, client version is at least one release, uh, you know, below or uh, or should be like exactly the same release. The reason for that is, uh, you know, Kubernetes sometimes deprecates some APIs and there are some changes in the schema. So your experience with Kubernetes might not be as good, so make sure uh, you're staying up to date. And when you're printing out this version, kubectl version command, 
you see that we have a version difference here already signaled as a warning. And obviously, if you have much bigger um, delta, then you might have some problems unexpectedly happening, and you'll be troubleshooting things that you shouldn't be troubleshooting. And, and that's where a package manager like Brew on, on Mac OS or even the G Cloud command line that can install some this kind of stuff, it will warn you if you get outdated, so it's easier to, to keep up with the new versions. All right, cool. So uh, anybody has problems with kubectl installation? Just I'm, I'm sure there's no problems, but uh, <laughs> I'm sure the problems coming when the Kubernetes installation starts. Uh, so okay, so now uh, we have our kubectl installed, and uh, obviously we need to have a Kubernetes cluster. So uh, hopefully everybody have you know Kubernetes installed on your laptop and. Uh, we probably want to give everyone some time to check. Uh, you know, maybe your laptop has been shut off, or just make sure. You know, if you have any Kubernetes cluster installed on your laptop, try to bring it up uh, and kick off your uh, process to, to to get started. So uh, probably until we finish that step, we cannot really move forward, but. Um, we want to quickly discuss about like while, while you like setting things up and bringing uh, up your Kubernetes cluster, um, probably just touch base on the area where I think I've seen a lot of questions coming from community and from companies, uh, from industry. So, like let's imagine you are you know working in a company and you need to work with Kubernetes day to day. And you need to like answer to the question like what is the requirements I should have in order to be able to develop, uh, build my images, uh, you know, run containers on my laptop and deploy them uh, to Kubernetes cluster, right? So I think this is the first three requirements that you really should kind of cross check. And it sounds very obvious, right? Like you know, Docker build, Docker run. Kubectl create deployment, those are like things that you probably do day and night. <laughs> uh, but like those are the things that you should be probably must have. The other things that I think less important uh, is something, you know, capability to run Docker Compose. I think Docker Compose is a pretty nice solution in the sense that you have a nice little YAML that you can put multiple applications, do Docker Compose up, it's gonna bring it up. Unfortunately, Kubernetes is much more complex, so instead of one YAML, you're gonna have 50 YAMLs. So uh, we've seen a lot of people in the community that like, oh, Docker Compose was nice, but you know, uh, we, we, we have to adapt to the Kubernetes world. So I see less and less uh, interest you know, around using Docker Compose. Uh, things like scanning images, I think, might be important for some organization. Uh, there's a lot of uh, open source solutions out there, like Trivi, for example, that you can install and, and do similar things. And then for the UI, I think it's, you know, like it's not as important, but some people like UIs. So I put this uh, requirements as an optional. And obviously the solution uh, for that is like 99%, maybe 95%, people are running Docker desktop, right? Like uh, for the Mac at least and, and Windows. Do you guys agree or disagree? Good. You have four agreements. Four. Five, so what? 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 What is? Uh, what else are you guys running on the Mac and Windows today? Okay. Good. Yep. Some traction for Rancher. <laughs> exactly. Wait, wait! Don't don't spoil the talk. <laughs> so yeah, uh, is any like Linux users in the house? Like Linux? Yeah. So Linux folks are in a happy. Uh, side of the world, uh, you know, they don't need to really have Docker desktop, right? Because they can just up get install Docker and up get install, uh, you know, maybe kubeadm, whatever Kubernetes cluster. So this this is not a problem for them, and they're not really looking for Docker desktop experience. But if you're on Apple and if you're on Windows, this you know, there's high chance that you know you using it and. This is something I, I think was running on our laptops for the last couple of years, uh, so. It was the default and only option a few years back, actually. So. Yeah, and if you, if, you, if you maybe forgot or if you don't remember, like, you know, that's where you can find the Docker <laughs> desktop on, the, on your 
uh, laptop for the Mac, and like maybe if it's shut down, please bring it up. You know, we want to use that uh, Docker desktop right now. Yeah, maybe that's the time to say again, don't install something else yeah. today if you have Docker desktop because you're going to burn the Wi-Fi down. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, so, some, some gentlemen in the room actually brought up a valid concern. Uh, so, myself and, and Sebastian, we're working in companies with over 250 uh, employers. And last year, Docker uh, basically said that, you know, if your company is larger than 250 people, uh, you basically have to pay uh, the subscription license. And this is kind of uh, not nice for a lot of people. Maybe they still, like, you know, not, didn't figure out that issue. And, like, I cannot install Docker desk support, period, because I'm going to get in trouble. Uh, and recently, they actually announced a raise. They're going to increase the price for team and uh, business, I think. Um, subscriptions. So the browse for the Docker desktop, multi-platform, amazing, nice UI. I think it's a great experience, uh, but unfortunately it's a paid product for enterprise. I personally was annoyed like coming to work and every time my laptop was updating Docker desktop, this was like pretty much twice, three times in a week. And it was like high CPU consumption, but like uh, this is uh, something, you know, less negative, but at least it was free before, but not anymore. So I actually spoke to many people and they were asking like, what I should do now? Like, I cannot use Docker desktop, but I want to use Kubernetes on my cluster. And actually, um, we put some of the solutions for you out there. So if your manager or somebody from your colleagues is going to ask you a question, you actually have several options today that you can actually take advantage. Uh, and we're going to quickly cover some of them uh, while your laptops are booting. So my favorite uh, option today, uh, I think, uh, is going to be Rancher, Rancher Desktop. Um, it's a pretty new solution. I would say it's last year it has been announced. Uh, it's free, open source, uh, backed by company, but you know, so far so good. Uh, the reason I like um, Rancher Desktop, first of all, that you know, it supports ContainerD, uh, which is like right now at default runtime for Kubernetes. Uh, but also it has support for Docker, just in case if you're still like running legacy Kubernetes clusters. You can choose the version uh, of Kubernetes cluster you want to deploy. But most impl importantly, I think they are, the way they architected this solution is pretty nice. So they actually using Nerd CTL. So Nerd CTL is basically a replacement for Docker CLI. So if you, you know, um, like even like Docker desktop, so they're saying if you, you cannot even use Docker CLI anymore. If you, know, if you, ha if you have it, so like you, you can't use it. So you need to find the, the replacement for it, right? And Nerd, Nerd Cuttle is basically a alternative, exactly the same, all the commands lines are the same, uh, that you can use uh, in order to talk to um, Kubernetes cluster uh, and uh, to build your images uh, and uh, you know, basically, it's based on container. Uh, another, you know, obviously, uh, another solution that uh, they interest, like, which is I really like as well, is that the Kubernetes itself is running K3S. So K3S is a lightweight Kubernetes clusters. So that makes uh, the platform lightweight as well. And K3S has been built for, you know, smaller clusters that are running on the edge. So like, it's a good use case for laptops, right? So the next option we have here, and that would be my best, my preferred, and that's usually the one I used on Mac, uh, Colima. So Colima is built on Lima. Lima is Linux on Mac. Colima is container in Linux on Mac. Uh, it's, I think it was the first solution to support M1 Macs um, natively. So it's a simple uh, kind of brew install Colima, and then you Colima start. It's going to build up, use Q QEMU uh, on your laptop, create a Linux VM, and then everything is executed into that. And it also bundles a, a Kubernetes cluster within it. And once again, Q3S, the same uh, as with Rancher. It has no UI at the moment. and, and 
I guess when you're using that, you don't need a UI anyway, but that's my personal take on that. And I, I guess after this talk, you will be done with UIs, <laughs> I hope. <laughs> All right. Uh, and, and not to mention, it supports Docker and Container D. So that means you can also pick the one you want and stay close, let's say, to your production clusters if you're using one of the other. Cool, yeah, no, that's absolutely. Uh, and finally, I would say maybe the least coolest, but it works, you know, if you're a Poorsman solution, like I think that's, that's gonna cut. So you can actually install Minikube. Uh, Minikube is basically fetches the VM uh, that runs Docker engine in it, uh, and you can install Docker CLI um, on your laptop, and then you'll be able to uh, open up some ports on Minikube and connect to Docker engine that sits inside of the VM. So you pretty much have Docker working on your laptop. Uh, doc, uh, so you can do the build images, you can do push images, and you have Kubernetes cluster where you can deploy things. So like, if you don't have, you know, choice, I think that that, that would work as well. But for today's uh, tutorial, we decided to choose another option. Uh, <laughs> uh, this it's called Kind. So. KIND stands for Kubernetes and Docker. Uh, it's a tool to create super lightweight Kubernetes clusters. And the reason they're super lightweight is because uh, they actually deploy it as a Docker images themselves, right? So uh, if you wanna deploy control plane, it's gonna be one Docker image. If you wanna deploy a node, it's gonna be another uh, Docker image. So that's why it's super lightweight. Uh, and it's uh, supported by Kubernetes six, and it can be deployed uh, for local Kubernetes clusters, but uh, in, the, in the early days of Kind, this was the solution to run CI uh, for Kubernetes itself. But you know, the, the use cases has expanded and I love to run Kind on, on my machine because it's super fast. Uh, Archie, tell me, it, we, we removed the other slides about the other options, right? Um, Is it the right time just to say about them? Like, say something uh, like yeah. Yeah, micro KLS. Yeah, yeah, I think it's fine. I mean, K3S. <laughs> Yeah, there's many options, and obviously, like, I think... Uh, K0S. Yes, there's so many options, but I think we try to find uh, the options that, you know, like, can replace Docker Desktop today, and, you know, if you're really looking for that solution, you have an answer, and the slides is yours. So, just to finish up with the kind, uh, so we're actually gonna go ahead now and install the kind cluster, right? We can, uh, yeah, we can. Yeah, okay. So there's one caveat actually with, with Kind, right? So as, as you remember, um, Kind itself is deployed as a Docker containers, right? So you need to have Docker engine somehow running on your laptop, but it's not free anymore with Docker desktop. So again, for the Mac and Windows users, you need to find a solution where you can actually deploy that Docker image to, that spins up the Kubernetes cluster. And we found the solution, uh, which is called Podman. So Podman is actually a solution from Red Hat guys, uh, and it's replacing Docker engine requirement for your laptop, and it also provides a rootless containers. Uh, I'm not a security, security specialist, but everybody says this is super cool and uh, provides, you know, much smaller footprint. I don't know for, for the personal laptop if it's, it's a big concern, but like I'm sure if you're running uh, in production, you know, you don't, you don't want to run containers as root. So Podman is a, they say, Swiss Army knife uh, that is maintained by Red Hat, replaces uh, Docker for desktop, Docker engine, and Docker CLI. Uh, Podman itself doesn't run Kubernetes, right? It's just replacement for uh, Docker uh, engine and Docker CLI. Uh, and it works for Windows, Mac, and Linux. Uh, and for people running M1, Max, it's also supported. So, and yeah. Podman is far more than just a replacement for the Docker thing. Yeah. There is a lot of tooling and new comments that you can use with Podman. It manages different kind of uh, images, uh, container images, how do you call that, type? Formats. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so it, it usually builds faster than using the regular Docker, for example. It's, it can build uh, and deploy rootless. That means you, you're sure you're 
whatever you deploy the container you deploy, it's not going to temper your, your, your laptop, for example. And it can be used even in your CI, in your CD, and, and why not in production, I guess. And some of them are using that, I guess. Yeah, and for people who love UI, they also have a Podman desktop, so like you can see your images and scans and stuff like that. So anybody's using Podman, just, I'm, I'm so curious. Oh, all right, so we're not alone, good. So yeah, so we'll have a quick demo uh, to install Podman and Kind. Again, like we're not recommending you download anything at, at this Wi-Fi, but you can try and at your own risk. Uh, so you want to do it or you want me to do it? Mm -hmm. Okay. So yeah, obviously you have nothing. You just grab the Podman command line, <coughs> uh, but so it's, yeah. just, it's just a CLI, and then. Exactly. then you need to bootstrap an, uh, an image or something to run the containers, uh, you know, kind of a virtual machine. And so Podman, the, Podman is intelligent enough to, to find on which lab, which kind of OS you're using and do some st few stuff a little bit differently. Uh, yeah. So on macOS, as every other solution, they are going. It's it's using an emulator. It's creating a Linux VM and then uh, it it runs things inside the VM. Yeah. So. Uh, in our case, we already installed Podman because it's, uh, I think, 600 meg image. Uh, so we're going to go ahead and check. <laughs> yeah, so Podman is up. So Podman info is giving a ton of information about, obviously, the VM, the memory, the whatever you have uh, installed. So what is interesting here in Podman is it's not much about, uh, about Podman itself, but it's going to create a virtual machine in your laptop, and you can change the CPU memory disk size, and I recommend you do that because the default is very small. So unless you don't want to run a very big Kubernetes cluster or, de or deploy many things, uh, you should increase that a little bit. Uh, so uh, we're not demonstrating that because one, so it's 600 megs to download, uh, and it's, it's not very interesting in the end, I guess. Um, what we, or what I usually do, uh, again, what we're seeing here are not recommendation, it's what we're do, usually doing, and it's what's making us like working faster with Kubernetes. Uh, just replace the Docker command line if you have it, and, and be careful because every Docker for desktop upgrade will reset that. Uh, I usually remove the Docker command line and I replace that with Podman. And I don't use aliases because uh, some commands are hard-coded for using Docker. So if you just alias in your shell and you run something, it's not going to work. You're going to have very strange errors. And just because uh, the, the Docker command line or the, the application you're, is, is looking for the Docker options or Docker stuff that uh, are not working actually with Podman or is working a different way. Most of the time it's about uh, the socket to reach to the Docker daemon. Yeah, so I'm just running Podman search command just to show like uh, what you can pull out from the Docker hub. Let's deploy quickly a container. So we're just deploying latest Alpine. That's gonna run for 20 seconds. And just to prove that everything is running, very similar command to Docker ps a so yeah, the, the, the Podman command line is 100% compatible with Docker. So whatever you do Docker, you can do Podman. And if you switch the binary, then you can just continue with Docker, but it's going to call Podman in the background. Yeah, and you can see we're running Docker PS, and the reason it works because we just basically hard linked it. Uh, it's basically just pointing to the Podman, but it's actually, you know, written as Docker. So. All right, so that's, that's done. We have a Podman running, up and running. So the next thing we want to do is to uh, install Kind. So we already pulled up Kind itself, and we're going to run Kind create cluster command. And obviously, you know, if you want to make sure your deployment is persistent, uh, you can also have option to deploy it with Kind uh, configuration file. Uh, where you can specify how many nodes you want to have. So kind is pretty flexible. You can deploy multiple control planes, multiple nodes if you want. But obviously, for the purpose of the demo, we just uh, went with the one control plane node and one worker node. We're installing Kubernetes 124. 
Uh, and anything else to call out? CNA, CNA is default. Yeah, we're just for warning. We're not going to use that, and, and we're not actually digging into that. So go read the documentation. But we're for warning some ports from the node, from the local node, to be reachable uh, inside our cluster. So that way you can install uh, um, <coughs> uh, an ingress controller, for example, inside the cluster later on and reach that from your laptop directly. Um, yes, yeah, so you can go with a basic command, can't create cluster, it's going to install it, but we here specifying a uh, config file. Um, and you, you should see, like, it's pretty fast. If you already, in our case, we already have images pulled out, so it should, you know, work pretty fast. Um, I don't know if anybody is trying to do the same right now, or hopefully not, but. <laughs> Nobody's starting a, a kind cluster right now? No? That's good. Oh, yeah, a few hands there. How is it, wor how is is it, it working? working? So the thing is, when you first install Podman, it's going to download uh, uh, a Fedora core image that is going to be used for the virtual machine. Once you do that, you do that once usually, then you stop the machine, the virtual machine, but the image is still here. So even if you delete that and you restart it, you're not going to re-download re the 600 megs. It's the same for Podman because Podman is before, sorry, for Can. Can is creating containers in, in the end. So yeah. it pulls the image, it creates the containers, and when the image are downloaded already, you can create as many cluster like quickly because the image is already here and available. Yeah. So we have uh, first cluster deployed. <coughs> uh, if we do Podman S, PS, sorry, uh, we see that we have two images, one for dev worker and one for dev control plane, and those are pretty much our uh, Kubernetes nodes uh, that is running as a Docker, Docker images, Docker containers, sorry. And just to prove that the cluster is up and running, if you do uh, kubectl get nodes, we can see that uh, we have two, uh, two nodes. One is for control plane and one is for uh, worker. Uh, this command, kubectl cluster info, just provides information uh, that is connected to Kubernetes API. And then if we're going to run kubectl get pods in all namespaces, we see that uh, we have a cluster control planes uh, images running, uh, such as kubeproxy, kubecontroller, kubeapi server, and uh, DNS. So it's a real Kubernetes cluster, actually. Yeah. Uh, so let's deploy a second one uh, just for you know, having two, two clusters so we can switch between them. So the difference here with the second one is instead of using one API server and one worker node, where we only have one API server, so that will also be the worker node. Yeah. Um, and for the sake of the demonstration, we're also changing the version. So this one is version 1.25. something. The two. Yeah. Um, this stanza is pretty long and complicated. It's the full hash to to whatever. Uh, and it changes every time there is a new kind release. So when you upgrade kind and you want to change or use the latest version of Kubernetes, uh, the recommended way is you go on the kind project uh, in the release page and you will have the, 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 the links, the full name of the releases. <coughs> that's usually how, how you want to do that. So that's why it's, and so what I do is this kind cluster YAML file, I store that in my Kubernetes uh, folder. And so if like I can reuse this file to deploy uh, this exact same cluster, same configuration on another node, on another, another laptop, or I can totally destroy the cluster and recreate it exactly the same. So that's very useful when you want to trash the cluster. You want to deploy something to break it and yeah. you can recreate it exactly the same, same version, same everything. Yeah, well, so we have both clusters up and running. Ooh. That's good. <laughs> so done. that's also another difference is because you have this config file, it's very easy to bootstrap multiple clusters on, uh, on the same laptop, uh, which is a little bit harder maybe or even impossible with Docker desktop or or even Colima, I, I don't even know how to do that, having multiple clusters by default with Colima. Maybe it's possible, I don't know, but um, Kine is just your Kubernetes cluster, so you can start the, the numbers of cluster you want. Yeah, so okay, so now we have kubectl, we have Kubernetes cluster deployed. Um, now the next step is basically to connect uh, kubectl to Kubernetes cluster, right? Basically we want to authentic authenticate and this is pretty much, uh, you know, the scenario where you have a laptop and 
you need to uh, be able to communicate through Kubernetes API uh, and you know talk to Kubernetes. How we can do that? Anybody remember or knows what what we need in order to to be able to initiate this communication authentication? Yeah, so we need a kubeconfig file uh, that basically tells us where to connect and how to connect. And I have actually a quick demo just to show uh, how we can work with uh, the kubeconfig file. So usually, the once once Kubernetes clusters of, of kind get deployed, what it's going to do is will automatically uh, update uh, kubeconfig look. Uh, file, so it will already populate uh, all the configuration for us. So it's kind of you know easy start. It, it's kind of a managed file. Usually you don't want to go play in that because that when you have multiple clusters with a like uh, uh, security CRT uh, certificates in that for authentication, it gets very like big and difficult to read. So there is tooling around that. But, yeah. but that, that's where everything happened, actually. Exactly. So what we have inside of the kubeconfig file is actually it's pretty simple file, right? I try to minimize it as much <laughs> as I can. But basically, uh, you have here uh, clusters, contexts, uh, and users, right? So clusters, if we open up clusters, it's pretty easy. Uh, basically, this cluster uh, is uh, trying to connect to GKE cluster. Uh, this cluster is trying to connect to one of the kind dev local cluster. So the IP address you see here is uh, the controller, API controller uh, IP address that it communicates. So this is very similar to VMworld, right? You need an IP to connect. <coughs> uh, next thing uh, we want to touch base is users. So uh, as you know, Kubernetes doesn't have users. So um, the way we have establish this communication. Uh, for example, for kind clusters, uh, we are creating, uh, during the Kubernetes cluster bootstrap, it generates uh, certificate keys uh, from that cluster. And uh, it's happened many times where, uh, you know, you, you bootstrap, you get the certificates, and uh, they have expiration date one year. So if you didn't upgrade your cluster for one year, you might get uh, expired certificate. So uh, something to look for. For a cloud cast, for the cloud, uh, you know, like for example, GKE, you can see here, they have actually a little bit more authentication provider configuration, so this is more secure. <clears throat> but uh, essentially, uh, you know, this is a certificate that coming from cluster that lets communicate uh, with the Kubernetes. And then we have context, right? So context is basically tells uh, where to connect. And then we have also the current context. So current context is basically tells, right now, my kubeconfig file is looking at staging cluster. And the reason it's looking for the staging cluster because uh, the last cluster we've deployed in the demo was staging cluster. So it's probably, you're gonna ask how we can switch that uh, to another one. And this is actually pretty straightforward, but still co complicated, at least for me, because uh, there's many commands that you need to run in order to get there. So the commands are, uh, so you can use kubectl config command, uh, and if you run kubectl current context, uh, you see that it's kind staging, which was exactly the same thing in the kubeconfig file. Uh, we can also see uh, what type of uh, context we have in our config file, so we can see here that we have kind dev, kind staging, and GKE cluster, and we can, for example, switch back to uh, kind dev Kubernetes cluster by running kubectl config use context kind dev. So once I do that, if I do get context, you can see that uh, my current context switched from kind staging to uh, kind dev. So this is the way that you have to do like every time to switch between clusters. Uh, it's not the best option, and we're gonna talk a little bit more in the future, like once we go to a more advanced tool, how to simplify this uh, pain. <clears throat> but for now, we're gonna go forward. And in general, you can also like, uh, there's some people like to split up these kubeconfig files into multiple files, so this is also covered here if you, you, know, if you wanna do that, uh, you can try it. 
So uh, I get it. It's boring, right? But that, that's how Kubernetes works. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so we, we want to explain like what's the basic, and then we're going to provide you with different tooling to ease that and to be faster with all that. All right. So so now like now you have Kubernetes cluster. You authenticate it with your kubectl command. The next thing you want to do is deploy uh, resources, right? Uh, so we have two commands, kubectl create and kubectl apply. Uh, and uh, obviously, you know, like the, the first steps that you might do is to run kubectl create deployment, create service, create config map. This is more imperative way where you basically specifying similar to what you, you know, we did before with virtual machines, just running commands. Uh, this, this method is not... Uh, Recommended, I would say it's good to starting. We always recommend to use uh, YAML manifest because it's a declarative way. Uh, you basically define your state in the YAML file, and then kubectl will apply this uh, request to Kubernetes cluster, and we have uh, something called control manager that will uh, every now and then uh, synchronize the state uh, of the you know, what is stored in etcd to the Kubernetes cluster. So we call this the declarative way, and this is the beauty of Kubernetes, and we highly recommend you to use uh, manifest files. So let's do a quick demo, deploy some applications uh, with kubectl create and apply. You guys trying to follow at the same time? How's it going? So far so good? I have thumbs up, so. All right. Not that bad. Keep on, keep on. It's, we're getting to the interesting part of the talk. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So the first thing uh, I also like to mention before we're going to go to like deploying things, uh, like we want to quickly talk about the namespaces. So uh, Kubernetes has, uh, once you deploy a Kubernetes cluster uh, out of the box, it has multiple namespaces that it, it, it uh, deploys. And the first namespace is called default. So this is where your current context is looking for. Every time you're gonna, you know, start with Kubernetes cluster, it's gonna be pretty much looking into the default namespace. Um, this is not a good practice, and we're gonna show how you can deploy things in a different namespaces. Uh, there's also kube not lease, kube not public, kube, uh, kube system. Those, those are the things that is created by the cluster itself. So kube system is a namespace that pretty much runs a control plane for Kubernetes. <coughs> so. So let's create a namespace. So this is kubectl create uh, namespace kubecom. Why not? And then we can do kubectl get namespace uh, to see that uh, our kubecom namespace has been created. Um, yeah. Okay. So. We see that in namespace kubecon, there is no pods right now deployed because we don't have anything right now, right? Oh, sorry. Yeah, okay. So let's deploy a... No, huh? no. No, no, it's okay, yeah. Uh, we're gonna just quickly deploy a uh, Nginx web server. Okay, you see, uh, we run kubectl get pods, there is nothing, and the reason is nothing because we're looking in the default namespace. So we wanna check what is deployed in the kubecon namespace, and we can see that uh, Nginx is coming up, is getting created. Move on, move on. Yeah. Yeah, so we created a service and deployment uh, inside of the kubecon namespace. So that's, that's the first demo. Uh, and then we're going to create a pod uh, that is basically created declar declaratively with YAML. And for that, we're actually using an interesting command which is called kubectl run, which creates pods. Uh, and we're using um, dash o YAML that basically uh, generates, dumps everything in the YAML file. And we are using dry run client uh, command which is basically doesn't apply it on the cluster, but you know, just on the client side. Uh, so let's, let's quickly do it. So we created a simple pod YAML file, and if you look inside, um, it's a pod that has been created. 
So this one? So yeah, it's a dumb way of creating a pod. So usually you use that when you want a very fast debug pod or test something very like fast. You, you will never do that in the real, or mostly never do that in the real life. Yeah. So now we're creating a deployment file. Uh, so deployment. So, you know, pod is uh, like the smallest, uh, uh, you know, the resource that uh, on Kubernetes cluster deployment is actually uh, something uh, more production ready. You can specify uh, replicas in it. So we're going to deploy a. Oh, this is not deploying. Run the next one. This is just generating. Oh, okay, just the generating. YAML. Yeah. Okay. Uh, the command down. There is another command yeah. which creates a faulty deployment. Okay. Why faulty? Because you don't have all the options. When you kubectl create deployment, you can't define everything that is needed for the deployment to run exactly as you wish. Uh, all right, so the final thing we're doing is creating a service with, again, like we right now are doing everything with the create service command, which is pretty much. Yeah. Uh, We're going to speed up because that's not interesting. And I yeah. guess most of you know about it. <laughs> um, all right, so uh, I'm going to deploy a quickly base up. Maybe you want to just, yeah. So now we're getting closer to the interesting thing, where, but we still need more in the cluster so to be able to demo. So it's a simple web application. So it's a, a Go application, a web app that we build. We created an image. Um, and there is a My, MySQL database along that. They tie together. And, and so just a simple application, very two deployments, two services. All right, so things are coming up slowly. So the difference here, we're using a declarative way. We have generated the YAML file uh, and this is, you know, this is how it looks like. It looks there's more lines there. The, we try to, you know, follow the best practices. Added liveness props, readiness props, re request request resources. So, this is how, you know, ideally you should uh, looking into deploying application into Kubernetes cluster. That's what you would do in a real life because this YAML file would be in your Git repo. So let me introduce if I can. All right, GitOps. Do GitHub. So you put all that YAML in a repo and you version that and you're good to go. Okay, so so now we have the basic stuff. As you've seen, like we could cut all, could cut all, could cut all. Yeah, so yeah, but basically we finished the part where we set up things, right? Uh, now, now we're starting to get into more interesting. So Luke Skywalker is getting older and, you know, it's starting to do uh, more serious stuff. <laughs> So uh, first thing that we want to actually address is like uh, that we're typing too much kubectl, uh, right? Uh, you want to show it as alias? I don't know. Next one. Yeah. Yeah. So aliasing. So kubectl. K u b e c t l. Uh, it's too long. Like let's use an alias like k equals kubectl. So now it's just k. Uh, you put that in your shell. So every time you open a new terminal, you will have this alias already uh, defined. I don't remember. Let's go there. Um, I'm typing too much. Yeah, yeah. just alias that. We, we, we copy that. We switch to the terminal. It's not working. OK. Alias, k, ega, coop, cuddle. And now, k get pods. Ooh. Ooh. Like it's it's five letters already. It's like one, two, three, four, five, six letters uh, less. That's the first trick. And seriously, you can't imagine how many people even train with Kubernetes. They don't use that. They don't know, or they just like they're used to type kubectl. And uh, I'm sorry, uh, the less I type, the more <laughs> I feel. Um, Kubernetes is based on APIs and, and object resources. Um, and pods, deployments, usually the, the, by default the resources are um, plurial, so you have an S at the end of most of them. Actually, you can remove the S. So again, one letter less to type every time. And they have short names too, so pod, okay, it's just PO, it's one letter, but for deployment, it's getting more interesting. For a stateful set, it's STS. So you're, again, you're getting uh, a lot less to type uh, every time. Um, so now that was for a kubectl, but like, you still have uh, other commands to that, like kubectl port forward, uh, port dash forward, like, oh, 
I, I can handle that. So there is completion in most of the shells now, Bash, CSH, or whatever. Um, and every, most of the Kubernetes CLIs, whoever they are, uh, they usually have a completion file. So you kubectl completion ZSH or kubectl completion bash, and it will dump a, uh, a long list of things for the shell to be configured. So you, again, you usually put that in your uh, shell configuration. So every time you start in a shell, this is run, and, and, then, um, and then you have it. So I, 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 I have nothing in this one actually at the moment. So I'm not sure I can demo that it's easily. Okay. No, maybe something else. <laughs> um, okay, let's go arguments too long. Maybe it will work if I do that. I don't know. Let's check. Okay, port forward, and there, there you go. So I just type port tab, port forward. Um, it's even better than that because um, what if I get pods, okay? But this is the default namespace. We deploy it also in the kubecon namespace. So minus n to, to, to target another namespace and then tab. Oh, what do I have? So in the background, kubecon all get namespace was run. Grab the list and then I have all that as options. So uh, I want to look in the kubecon actually, kub tab. Oh, I have multiple kub something, so it's kub con. And there I go. Every time I, I, I do a tab, it's going to do completion. And I can check the pods here. Um, so this is a side note. Um, I don't know why it's here in the presentation, but we had to put that somewhere, is that uh, kubectl command and the, the Go client for, for, for uh, kubectl is sometimes using a lot of resources, like opening a lot of files, doing a lot of calls to the API server. Uh, most of the time on Mac, the, the number of Mac's open file is like 256 or something like that. So it's usually good practice to like raise that a little bit. So that's why it's here in the presentation. Uh, so, okay, so now we're faster with kubectl. Uh, yeah, that's good, and, and we have hints. It can help us a little bit, but you can go even like beyond that. Yeah, yeah. Okay, um, so um, this talk is based on ZSH, so we picked OhMyZSH. OhMyZSH is a framework that you install in your shell. It's going to like bring up a lot of, of things already set up for you, uh, shortcuts, and, and like we're going to see a lot of stuff. Um, plugins, for example, here, um, and what plugins do, for example, let's, let's have a look. Um, can we have a look? No, not yet. Okay, uh, I'm going to, sh to finish these slides first. And there are themes that you can apply on all my ZSH. So I used to use Agnoster ZSH theme for a long time. Uh, it's very good, it's like bringing a lot of, of, of different things. And then I discovered the power, power level 10K. Uh, this theme is a beast actually, and it, it's adding a lot, a lot of feature that we're going to demo uh, in a moment. Um, but for that to work the best, you need a, a specific font uh, that they call power line or power fonts usually. So it's kind of a, a fonts with very specific uh, design. And, and when you use that, let's say in your, to define the prompt in your shell, it's going to be like way easier to read. Uh, so. Hey, great. Uh, this is the next one is I think. There is a you next want a demo, or is I think this one is less demo, but like uh, let's see the next one, the cube color. Okay. So yeah, that's the kind of stuff you're going to add in your shell, and because oh my ZSH, if you add the cube color plugin, uh, the alias that we used previously is going to be created by default. So actually, we can remove whatever we we added just before. Um, so what do you get when? Uh, when you install that. So remember, we hear Arcadia is the name of my laptop. Everything is uh, black and white. Uh, maybe like, not obvious to read, okay? Uh, when you install, when you install the, the, the OhMyZSH plus the poor uh, font shell, uh, 
the power line shell, uh, you get a prompt. And what is the prompt? The prompt is here the si on the left side and on the right side of your, of your shell. Uh, you have some information by default. So all that can, can be changed, tweaked, and whatever. So here on the left, I have uh, like Apple because I'm on a Mac, I guess. Uh, the small house, just because I'm in my default user folder. So if I go in the demo folder, for example, uh, and you see when I do a tap, for example, completion is now red, so it's easier to read already. Uh, okay, so then I'm in a folder uh, about the demo. Um, there is a lot of, of things that is coming with the installing this, this, this tool, like oh my ZSH and the theme, and I'm not an expert in that. Like it's bringing, I'm, maybe I'm using like 5% of the thing, and like, People will keep asking me, like, but why should I install that? Like, it's doing too much for me. Well, I'm going to be lost. No, you're not, because you can still work exactly as you were working before installing that. It's just that you're going to discover that this small feature or this other feature is helping, and you will grow with that uh, with some time. Uh, if I go, let's say I, I go back here, I go in dev, personal, GitHub, and I go to the cloud native, Canada here, um, and then this is our repo for the for the presentation. And you've seen the the, the prompt is now uh, green, and we have a small GitHub uh, thing, and we have a kind of a, let's say a branch. Uh, and I'm actually on the branch last tuning right now, so I can like git branch git branch me group me. Damn it. Yep. Check out. <laughs> Stressed. All right. Okay. <laughs> uh, I'm on the main branch. So now it, 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 you see that uh, we're here on the main branch and we know it, uh, we know about it. Um, Can you show a cube color thing? Yeah. So this is not about Kubernetes. Yeah. Uh, this, but so yeah, no. Let me go back to the shell. I'm sorry. Um, this is not about Kubernetes. Okay, we go to our demo, and when we kubectl. Oh, oh, so by the way, there is the kubectl plugin for OMI ZSH, and when you install that, what you get is uh, alias grep kubectl. A ton of new aliases here. And all these are shortcuts to a lot of Kubernetes commands. Uh, Can you do a uh, kubectl get pod, for example? So, yeah, if, if I want k for kubectl, that's our alias, but I want to get pod. g, get, and p pod. Bam. Three letters, and I have all my pods. Um, or services. Nope. Yes. So, yes. Okay, get. Yes. I don't. SEC. You yeah, see, okay. I'm not using that much, actually. <laughs> uh, I don't know why. I'm trained, I'm, I'm used to K something, so I'm using K instead of Kubectl. I'm not using all these aliases, but sometimes they are like, they can get very efficient. And the more you're tapping and, and, and using the long comments like port forward, rollout history, scale deployment, for example, uh, that's three letters instead of a, a, a whole lot of comments. Um, so we're switching now to kubectl. So we, as we said, it's still black and white in the terminal and maybe not ready, not easy to read. Um, kubectl is a tool that was developed uh, some time ago um, and was unmaintained in the last few years. So I decided later, recently to like clone the thing and making it live again, apply the patches. So it's straightforward to install. It's brew install. So there is. The new project is in kubectl folder, so it's brew install kubectl tab kubectl. Uh, you can grab the version from the, the GitHub repo. Uh, you can install that directly from Go if you have the, uh, the Go command line. Um, so this is a way to set the version to latest, for example, but you can pick any version you want. Um, and the kubectl is kind of a replacement for kubectl. It's not actually a replacement because kubectl is going to call kubectl in the background and is going to take the output from kubectl and color it. 
So let's just have a demo. Whoop. What did I do? So yeah, this is the difference. We had only black and white, and now we have like black, white, and blue. Well, that, <laughs> that's the, because only, everything is running. But the, that's one one color better. Okay, but what happened in in the real life? You have crash crash pods. Um, you have pods just started, so you can change all that. So it, it's pretty obvious that in the default namespace, the test pod is not running here. It's pretty obvious that the age is only six minutes ago, so that's my new deployment actually that just failed. Um, and, um, and, and yeah, and, and that works for most of the kubectl commands. Um, so whatever you type, you, it, it's going to be like very helpful. So the thing is, alias, alias, um, uh, cdl equals kubectl. So by doing this, every time I type kubectl, uh, it's actually kubectl. So now we have an alias. So k, again, k get pod, bam, I have the coloring here. Uh, I can describe, k describe pod go web app like the, you know, the simple deployment, for example. Simple deployment, blah, blah, blah. And here again, I do have some coloring in here. So it's very easy, straightforward to see what's going on. Here are the last uh, message that is failing. Uh, it's a great helper. So that is good color. Still you, me? Yeah, okay, absolutely. and the next one. <laughs> so the next tool is Stern. Stern, I don't know why. I, who knows about Stern already? One, two, three, four. Maybe five. <laughs> uh, it's an, a very interesting tool. Uh, Stern is a way to add colors and to, to, to filter how you get the logs from the pods. Like kubectl logs is a command you run a ton of time. Usually you deploy something, it's not working, you want to go and see what's happening, you're going to grab the logs. Um, what is Stern giving you is coloring with different colors every pod. And if you have multiple containers inside the pod, there are, going, there are going to be added here also. That means in one command, you can dump all the logs of all the containers inside, inside a pod. Um, is that for service mesh in this case? Sidecars? Yeah, it, like, like sidecars or whatever. Like here we have, a, we have a front end, an API, and a SQL proxy all in one pod. I don't know why, don't ask me. But <laughs> uh, um, that's where it, it gets useful. And actually, it's even more than that. Uh, if we switch to the demo here, if we switch, so kubectl, so kubectl, you have some example here. You can go back. There's different ways to see that. Stern. Um, so usually you would do that. Like, oh, do we have the multi-deployment? Or this is the multi-deployment. So let's deploy that. It's another thing we're deploying. And then we can look at it. So k get pod. OK, we don't care. We did that already. K logs, okay? This is what you usually do is K logs in the default namespace with a selector. I want the logs from the application which has a label app equal multi-deployment. And that's usually what you do. And what you get is, uh, because we have, it's a deployment, we have two pods, we're getting the logs from the two pods, but Defaulted container first, out of first and second. That's they, there is two containers inside the pod, and k logs is only giving the, for the first container. Uh, if you want the second one, then you have to tell it. Like I want second, and is okay. It's not. It's even not allowed when you. you or maybe it's minus c. I don't remember. You see, I don't use that often. Okay, uh, minus C to say I want specifically the second container, and that's what we're getting here. Um, but with Stern, you can get much easier, right? And yeah, look at that, Stern multi. And bam, we have like in yellow and green, two different pods. 
with each the container first and second, which is named here first and second. So in one command, we can quickly like grab all the, the same kind of pods. So that means the multi I just typed here is actually a selector. So of course I can go multi deployment if I want. Uh, or, okay, get pod. Um, or you can target one specific if you want. Uh, so you can put the full name. So and there's a, a lot of other options we're not going to. And as you see, it it's tailing. That means if new logs are coming, they're going to be displayed. That's the equivalent to the to the W option on the the kubectl logs. All right. Thanks, uh, Sebastian. Uh, we're not Is it my done, time? Done. No, we're not done already. No? Because um, we we have another stuff which it's it's a new addition. Uh, to what we do. So we're just going to redeploy. It's kind of another version of the same deployment here. The difference, as you can see here, is it's very dumb. We never do that, but uh, when the container is starting, it's just echoing something, a message. And now the message is JSON. Uh, and that's a way to demo that with Stern, you can dump, so the command is just here. Stern multi as before, but I want the output as JSON. And actually, I can pipe that into JQ. And we're running very light, so we're going to, to, to move forward. But um, that's new options. You can JSON here or X JSON, which is given, like, it's parsing the message itself as JSON too. Um, so Stern, like, it, it, it's one of the tools I guess I use the most. Yeah, thanks, Sebastian. Um, honestly, like if you, you saw these two tools, right? Uh, you have to install them separately, like uh, binary. Uh, and we actually, in Kubernetes uh, community, we actually recently uh, find a, a nicer way to actually integrate those uh, solutions. Uh, so <clears throat> we have a, a kubectl cube plugin uh, mechanism right now where you can bring the, the different solutions like uh, Sebastian showed uh, two kubectl. So now it's going to be part of the kubectl command line, right? So, uh, and the, the way you're going to be doing this is you can go to a kube, uh, the website, uh, which is uh, for, called Crew. So uh, Crew is a kubectl plugin manager. Uh, and if you go uh, on their website, you can actually see uh, that today they have uh, over 200 uh, different interesting plugins that you can use. Um, we're going to cover maybe a few of them. Uh, the most interesting ones, but like uh, I think this is a, you know a nice way to actually bring any nice ideas like Sebastian had with Cube Color. It probably should be here uh, at the plugin manager uh, for for um, Crew. So Crew is basically all it does is it installs the plugins for uh, Cube Cuddle. and uh, one of the plugins that uh, we want to show is actually. Um, First plugin that we want to mention is something called kubectl need. So uh, kubectl need uh, lets you to strip up uh, the YAML file. So uh, give me just uh, example. Let's I'm just going to show. Yeah, yeah. So the idea is when you kubectl get something in the cluster, you will get the YAML, but you will get a ton on, of other information that you don't care about if you what you want is the actual YAML or even dump the YAML, store it somewhere for reuse or store it, modify, and, and, and reapply. So need is a, a plugin that is tripping everything that is not needed, that is specific to this deployment or this, and is not needed to replicate or to store the YAML. Uh, so yeah, we, we don't need the demo. Well, All right. I think we're going to speed up a little bit now. Yeah, so <laughs> if we uh, do kubectl release now, you can see that those are the plugins we installed for our cluster. We have. CTX, we have NEAT, we have NS, Stern, uh, and uh, some others. So, like, you're probably gonna guessing, okay, which one is a good one. So, uh, I'm actually gonna show you a um, kubectl NS and kubectl CTX. So, uh, remember that we have this process that we need to, you know, run kubectl commands. Uh, you can do this much easier now with kubectl NS. You can actually now easily switch um, Oh, kubectl, sorry. Kubectl yeah. NS. 
Yeah. So that so was, NS that's is, the old way. Of yeah. Working. Instead of kubectl uh, config get context, for example. Yeah. Or so. or kubectl get ns. It's for for name spaces. It's more le maybe less obvious uh, because k get ns or k ns. You're just like switching the get. Um, but when you when you want to switch, it's just k ns, and you can change the default namespace. So bam, you're in another one, and, and whatever you type is going to be applied in this new namespace. Let's move, let's yeah, all right. Uh, another plugin that we want to show is uh, kubectl ctx. So this one is basically lets you easily uh, switch clusters. So if, if uh, I run kubectl Kube ctx, Kube uh, you, you can see uh, our uh, current cluster is uh, kind dev. So uh, we can actually change it to staging with one command, right? So it's much easier experience than before we have to like type three commands to list current context and then switch to the context. So that's the thing you will probably use the most out of this demonstration is KNS and key CTX and switch back and forth. Yeah. Uh, you want to talk about Kubi or? Yeah, and we have another option. Uh, like when you, when you, as you saw, the context is written in the kubeconfig file, so it's global. So if you have multiple shells and you switch one to another namespace, all your shells are going to be switched to another namespace. Um, so Kubi is a way, it's a, it's a little application that is using the, 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 the kubectl mechanism and, and in kind of stripping your, your configuration file to be specific to the shell. So when you, you use kubi, it works almost the same as ctx, is kubi ctx, and you select a, a, a cluster. And this cluster will be the only one known by the shell. That means you can then change the default context, it will not change in this shell. So if you have multiple shell, you can have one specific to uh, your development and another shell for staging, let's say, and the third one for production. Um, yeah, that's, it, I like this for demos when you want to show like three clusters uh, and run three commands on the different tabs. You can just use QB uh, and it's going to have every tab will has its own context, right? It's pretty cool. Uh, there, there's also QB exec. So it's a way to say I want to execute that on these contexts. So you can target one command to many clusters. Like if you want to get pod and, and see the difference between dev and prod uh, or and staging one command and you can see all the pods and, and the difference between them. Um, that is coming, like it's a lot of, of, uh, of, of, like you can do a lot with that, but it gets very dangerous quickly because K delayed pod and, and you're going to delete the production actually. Uh, be just because, oh, wrong shell, I'm sorry. <laughs> just destroy everything. Um, how do you do to know exactly in which context you're using in which shell? Uh, that's where we have the prompt here. Oh, yeah. So, oh yeah, but we have a slide for that. Yeah. Uh, we have the prompt. <laughs> uh, so we talked about the prompt previously when we installed OMIZSH and the theme. Um, but the theme is coming with some very interesting feature, which is dynamic values in the prompt. And how you can see here uh, on the lower side uh, in, in pink here, is the kind demo cube system. Uh, it's showing you which context you're in and which namespace you're in. Uh, so it's as easy as, as you see, I type K and bam, kind dev is shown on the right. See if I K and S, let's say cube system, and I type K again, now I have kind dev, which is still our cluster, so the context and cube system, which is the namespace. It's not showing the namespace where you're in the default. Um, so all this is coming from the theme. Uh, the, it's working for K, it's working for cube cuddle, uh, it's working for Istio cuddle, for example. And all that is something that you can configure. Actually, uh, when you install the theme, you have a P 10K ZSH file that is created with all your configuration. And if we search for kubectl, uh, if we search for kubectl, 
here we have a power level 9K. So the, some of the comments are still named about the previous version 9K instead of 10. But here is the list of all the comments that will act as if it was kubectl and will display this prompt, this dynamic prompt. And you have that for kubectl, you have that for, for Terraform, you have that for AWS CLI, you have, and there is a ton of information and of stuff you can configure in, in this. And, and again, this, all this is coming like for free uh, when you install the thing, and then you will learn about it and you will tune that to your specific uh, needs and wants. Cool. All right. Thanks. I will, um, yeah, I'll carry the rest uh, part. So we obviously you can do similar things uh, with your cloud providers, um, but we want to move forward and just quickly touch base on the part, how you can actually deploy your applications, right? Uh, so usually when you're deploying your application to dev staging and production environment, there's going to be some changes in your deployment, right? And what are the options you have out there in order to solve this challenge? Uh, I, my personal recommendation is, you know, if you have something simpler, to deploy, and you know, we have a nice tool called Customize, right? Customize is a Kubernetes native, template-free uh, way to customize applications. So you have your existing YAML file, uh, and you create a customization uh, file that will customize it for dev staging and production, and you can apply this uh, manifest uh, with changes to the different environments. So basically, your existing manifest is not gonna change, uh, so we call it base. Uh, you're going to create a folder structure for your overlay, which is going to be maybe in this case dev staging and production. And you will say, I want to modify my deployment only, and I'm going to be changing replica count, for example, for my file. So this is an example uh, where we're using customize. Uh, we have base YAML, which is our you know untouched existing uh, manifest, and we have patch YAML, which is we call overlay. And when we combine those um, changes together, uh, on the right side, you can see that um, the, the, the pod uh, took uh, the value from our patch, right? So you can imagine that uh, basically you can apply the similar one, but for staging, similar one for production. So you'll be able to modify your deployment without any pretty much conf changes, configurations, you can uh, easily to uh, modify it. Uh, this is on the left side, this is the structure of the customized. So if you want to, you know, uh, build it, you have your base, which is your existing uh, YAML manifest. Uh, in this case, there is a folder called dev. There, there could be other folders like staging and production. And that, that's where you're putting your uh, customizations, right? And uh, then you can uh, build hydrated manifest that has already the values that needs to be deployed for dev environment, and you can do kubectl deployment. Can we skip? Yep. to the thing specifically. Sure. Now, we have another tool which is called Helm, right? And Helm, uh, it's a, a little bit different. It's a, uh, something uh, you, you have to templatize, right? So we think Helm is a great solution for things that already exist out there. So if you want to install any application uh, that you see at KubeCon or any database, uh, we have Artifact Hub that stores all the Helm charts, and you can deploy any existing applications. Uh, so basically the way it works, you're pulling your uh, chart from the artifact registry or artifact hub and you can deploy in your Kubernetes cluster any existing CNCF application. Uh, uh, yeah, the interesting part here, man, because maybe, maybe it's not well known, it's when we deploy with Helm, uh, I wanted to emphasize on uh, Helm, this kind of command, but there, there are like quite new, I guess, maybe for with Helm 3. Uh, Helm show values, so you can display the values that are defined in the chart. So if you don't know what to tune before you deploy, you can have a look at them very quickly. Uh, and then you have Helm templates to generate. So you see, I, I've set some alerts here. So I'm changing some values that I, I grabbed just from the command above, and I'm just generating the template for review. Then I can install. Once you install, uh, Helm will create a secret in the namespace uh, where you deploy the application. And in this namespace, it's going to keep a trace of what was deployed, what are the values, what are the YAML, and it's used for Helm to a, either roll back or, uh, or, or, or keep track of what was deployed, what worked or not, if the deployment was successful or not. Um, so I really uh, like this command Helm diff that shows yeah. difference between what you deployed before 
and you, let's say, applying a new chart with some modification, it's gonna give you exactly what is gonna change instead of trying to figure out uh, all the changes that is coming yeah. in that chart. Th that's another cool comment. If you're using Helm quite often, like install the plugin for a, for a diff. Um, and then this, this secret that I, I was talking about. Uh, so you can see what was deployed in the cluster Helm list. You will see uh, what, what, what projects were deployed. History of the project, let's say we deployed Prometheus. We want to see the history. Uh, there was two deployments. And then you want to see the values that were used to deploy uh, this application with Helm. So Helm get values and, and you can have all that. So all that is coming from the secret that was deployed. So you can also, because it's a secret, you can access it. Uh, so you see there is two secret because we had two deployments and you can get secret with this uh, very funky command uh, base64 two times and then unzip. Uh, you can see what's uh, inside, the, inside the secret and what's, what was used for uh, all right. So I think we're getting to the dark side of the things already. Like uh, we're going to talk about UIs, and this is like the ultimate stage. And the reason probably you want to use something like UIs, uh, you already have things deployed on your cluster, uh, but you want to try to figure out maybe what's happening. There's maybe many users on the cluster. You know, keep cuddle, get commands not always as visible, right? So there's actually a lot of interesting options out there that we want to recommend. Uh, one of them is K9S. Uh, so K9S is basically uh, a, a CLI uh, a slash UI. I don't know how you call this. Uh. It's a UI on top of Kubernetes. So yeah. for the fall, it's like you can, if you have double screen, you open one terminal on the other screen, you start K9S and you, will, you're, you are able to see live what's happening in the cluster with some uh, metrics and information. Uh, yeah, so you can basically, uh, stay in this UI and you, you know you can drill into the pods, for example, you want to know what's running, you can see the logs. You so can have, even edit or delete some of the resources, so it's working with all the resources and, and your Kubernetes cluster. Yeah, you can do port forwarding out of this. There is a, I think there is a obviously curve to learn, but like once you look into the, the resources and, and helps, like it's starting to make sense. So um, we have a few, few things uh, in the tutorial that you can uh, probably go ahead and also, you know, check at home. Yeah, we're, we're getting late. It's yeah, totally yeah. late. We have a ton of, of stuff to, to That's okay. No, we don't have. Uh, the other one uh, that we would recommend is Lens. Uh, Lens is the full application. You install that. Uh, it gets access to all the resources. It, it, it's straightforward. It's multi-cluster, so it's grabbing the clusters you have in your in your cube configuration, uh, and you can switch from one to the other. It, the interesting part that I kind of just learned, and I'm not into UIs, but uh, if you are, I just talk about the Helm secrets. You can drill in the Helm secrets directly from this UI. Uh, it's, if you have Prometheus deployed, it's going to grab the metrics from your cluster. So you have in the UI already like a view of how the cluster is behaving. And if you're into, you deploy the port and you want to port forward into it to, to check what's running on this port, uh, you can do that directly from the UI. So it, it's a very neat tool if you're into UIs. Yeah, no, obviously it's really to observe things happening and the nice thing about Lens is deploy it not inside of the Kubernetes cluster, it's sitting on your laptop and this lets you to connect to many clusters and have a single plane uh, of looking and it's just, you know, so this is our nice last minute. So I'm sorry, we were like, we spent too much time at the beginning, I guess. Uh, look at the slides, look at the, you can download the slides from, from the, 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 the schedule website. Uh, look at the content of the website uh, in the GitHub repo. Uh, there is a ton of stuff like, uh, there is only three VS Code extensions, but they're like worth it. Like, seriously, show, oh, we switch over. Yeah, yeah. Um, there is different other tooling. Uh, there is Diesel. Diesel is like JQ, but works with YAML, JSON, and whatever, so it replaced JQ, YQ, and whatever. Uh, have a look at that. It's uh, yeah, and uh, we're going to keep the uh, uh, the site up and running. So you know, if you want to come back home and run through the steps, uh, it's going to be there. And yeah, please leave your feedback. Uh, you know, we're happy to improve. Um, and yeah, we open for questions. Thank you very much. But we're here, if you have some questions.
Is there anything af after? All right, I was just wondering, is there a recommendation between like if combining Helm with Customize, like is that considered bad practice or is that okay? Like do you have any opinions on that? It, it's a great question. We had no time to, to, to talk about that, but yeah, the Customize, that's why uh, we recommend, I think it's working, we, re we recommend using the full version of Customize. Actually, Customize is embedded in kubectl. Um, but it's a lighter version, you don't have access to all the features. Sometimes you may find some blocking things. If you use the full version, no problem. And Customize can use plugins. So plugins can be just a, a shell script or something, uh, or a container that is going to be run. So obviously you can have a Helm plugin that is going to render the chart as YAML and pass that into Customize. Then you can use Customize to apply a patch or drop or add something into the, into the final YAML. So yeah, uh, Customize is a nifty tool and it totally complements and help Helm because like I'm not a Helm lover and, and for I guess for good reasons and Customize can patch what Helm is not able to do. What was that command you, you did that brought up all the aliases earlier? I missed that. I'm sorry, can you repeat? What, what you, you did some command that brought up a list of aliases of kubectl and... So, okay, uh, how to list the aliases that are bring up by, by the, the theme and the, oh my, his ESH. So it's just the alias command in the shell. It's going to list all the aliases that are created. So I just showed you some of the kubectl aliases, but actually there is a ton other aliases for git comments, for example. Exact same thing. Instead of git checkout something, it's J, C, uh, like I don't know them. I'm actually not using them much, uh, but for, there is a ton to explore. For, this is all, all my ZSH. So if you like, as soon as you install, you'll get all of these aliases. And I think it's better than you'll be doing it yourself. Uh, yeah, that, that's, that's good. Any other questions? Oh, links there, okay, sure. So the slides, slides if you in. go to the schedule website or, yes, at the bottom of the schedule, there is the slide. Yeah, and I'm just gonna put the link for the website itself. So thanks again for attending. Thank and you very I much. I hope you learned something.